The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning to some and afternoon to others. Uh, we welcome and thank you for attending our webinar on radiation sterilization validation today. This webinar is designed to provide information for beginner and intermediate level persons who are using further details into the radiation sterilization process. And here to present today are Mel Martel Winters and Wendy Wainsgard, our resident experts here at Nelson Labs. Um, just a little bit of background information if you missed one of our webinars and would like to refer back to it. You can always find them on our webinars page or at the notes there. You can receive these types of notifications. Um, another type of user update by becoming a fan on the Nelson Labs Facebook uh, page or follow Nelson Labs on Twitter. As for the webinar today, uh, we welcome your questions and you can submit them at any time. Uh, Martel and Wendy will randomly answer as many as possible during our last 15 minutes. Um, if you have a product specific question, um, go ahead and write it down, save it, contact uh, Martel and Wendy about it after the webinar. You can reach Martel at 801-290-7864 and Wendy at 801-290-7830. Uh, now let me welcome and tell you a little bit about Martel and Wendy. Martel Winters received a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology with a minor in Chemistry from Brigham Young University. He has been at Nelson Laboratories for 16 years. He is currently a senior scientist for Nelson Labs. Martel serves on the AAMI Microbiological Methods, Sterility Assurance Level, Radiation Sterilization, General Criteria for Sterilization and Terminology Working Groups. He is currently heading an AMI task force for, doc, for a document regarding sterilization of tissue products. He is also on the AAMI Sterilization Standards Committee and the AATB Standards Committee. Martel is a registered microbiologist with the NRCM as a specialist microbiologist. Wendy Wangsgaard has a PhD in pharmacology and toxicology from the University of Utah, where she also received a Bachelor's of Science and a minor in Chemistry. She is currently a study director for radiation, for radiation sterilization in Nelson Labs. She is a member of the AAMI Microbiological Methods, Radiation Sterilization, Sterilization Terminology, and Sterility Assurance Levels Working Groups. Welcome, Martel and Wendy. The time is now yours. Welcome, everybody. We, uh, understand that at the beginning there was some echo in there and from the comments that we see that appeared that we have that we have fixed those. And so we apologize for that problem we had there at the beginning. So we'll get going here. Um, okay. Just a moment, please. Okay. We have about 40 minutes to cover a lot of material here. And then, we'll, like Mike said, we'll have the questions afterwards. So we'll go through this. Please keep track of your questions. We'll start off by building a foundation regarding, uh, we'll talk about bioburden testing, recovery efficiency, we'll talk about verification doses, and then fluidity testing, along with bacterial phases, fungus phases, or VF testing. Then we'll talk somewhat about practical use, about validation methods, and if we have time, we'll cover a few, uh, a few associated topics at the end. To start off, a, uh, in a bioburden test, what we're looking for, the definition is a population of viable microorganisms on or in the product. 
and uh, we're just looking for the count of microorganisms present on the uh, on the device after the after all steps of manufacturing. Now we record the uh, bioburden results as a colony forming unit or as a CFU rather than reporting it as microorganisms because as you see on the picture on the right, the what sometimes microorganisms will stay clumped together. So in a bioburden test, you see the plate on the left with the colonies on it. We don't know if those colonies started off as one discrete microorganism or a clump of microorganisms like you see on the right. So in, in Barber reports, you'll see them as colony forming units. I have a video here. Hopefully, this will work okay. Just to give a quick, uh, quick and simple idea of a bioburden test. We start off. I uh, have some controls there. Uh, so this is our kazoo catheter we put together for demonstration purposes. You see that we're cutting it up to expose all of the surfaces of the product. We then add a sterile extraction fluid, and we then perform several different shaking methods. We have a manual shake method. We have a stomaching method, which works very well for towels and other soft products like that. We have a reciprocal shake, which goes back and forth for a period of time. We have an orbital shake, uh, which is about a one-inch stroke, which also goes for time. And then this is a sonicator. And we have a Friday night shake, for those of you that like a bit of comedy. Uh, after these extraction methods, and hopefully the microorganisms are off of the product and in the solution. So then we place a 0.45 micron filter onto the, on the, the manifold, and we weigh out a certain amount of fluid that we filter, so we know exactly how much we filtered compared to how much was in there. After filtration, that filter is then placed onto an auger plate. And then that auger plate is placed in an incubator and allowed to grow. Now, we use a couple of different growth conditions. Uh, the first that we incubate for aerobic bacteria, that is usually on soybean casein digest auger which is also called PSA, just case play auger, and usually at 30 to 35 degrees C for three to seven days. And after the incubation time, we then just do a visual count of the colonies on the filter. Then we also incubate for, typically for fungi, which includes molds and yeast. That is commonly either a potato dextrose auger or a sabarod dextrose auger at 20 to 25 degrees C for five to seven days and then counted. Now sometimes we can do what we call reincubation, which means we'll use the same auger plate, which will, so SCDA will incubate first aerobically at 30 to 35 degrees C for three to seven days and then count the plate and then put the plate back in a 20 to 25 degree incubator for another five to seven days and then count. Now some frequently asked questions. Often people are testing for spores, so why, how about testing for spores? Now spores, uh, in, in nearly all cases, the spores will also grow in the aerobic bacteria test, which means that it is not appropriate to add your spore count to your aerobic bacteria count. It really, the, the purpose for testing for spores is to find out what percentage of your bioburden can form spores, rather than, uh, rather than for any other other purpose. We also get questions frequently, what about testing for anaerobes? Now, our experience is that most anaerobes on medical devices are facultative, which means that, that they, those organisms can grow either in the presence or in the absence of oxygen. And they might prefer one over the other, but they'll often grow in, in, both, in both conditions. So really, since most medical device anaerobic microorganisms are facultative, then they will also grow in the aerobic bacteria test. So just like with the spores, it is usually not appropriate to add your anaerobic count to your aerobic count unless you are certain that they are strict anaerobes, meaning that they will only grow in the absence of oxygen. So in most cases, again, people are just determining what percentage of their organisms can grow anaerobically. Now, sometimes testing for anaerobes is necessary, and one example for that is 
uh, if we're testing products that we know comes from an anaerobic environment, for example, human tissue, which is used for transplantation. A plate count, I think I mentioned earlier that it's really just a visual count. We're not using a microscope in, in that situation. So here's the Philtrophius, and you just count colonies, and that is what we report as the colony forming units on a biodiversity report. Now sometimes you might see something like this. This is often called TNTC, or too numerous to count. And these, these situations, um, Actually, I think I have a slide here where I'll we'll discuss that briefly. Uh, another type of incubation condition we have is called a spread plate, where rather than filtering the solution, if it's too viscous to filter, for example, then we'll just take a small portion of the solution and add it to the surface of the media and spread it around and then incubate. And we are still counting in the same fashion. Frequently get questions about what is a good biobirding count? And uh, the questions that we often ask to understand that is, what is your sterilization method? Uh, if it's radiation, what is your sterilization dose? So what kind of products are they? If it's a radiation sterilized product, often a, uh, a lower count is desirable. By lower, we're usually talking much less than 1,000 CFU, and somewhere in the 1, 2, 300 CFU range is very desirable. If we're talking about an, a, an overkill method, like ethylene oxide, or steam sterilization, then often the higher bioburden counts have little or no impact on the ability of the sterilization method to provide sterile products. So it's a, it, that question is, is variable uh, depending on, on the situation. What do we do with high bioburden counts? Like I showed you this picture earlier, uh, in most cases uh, it, it's appropriate to investigate the process and the raw material to if there's anything there that might be contributing. If you have some knowledgeable people involved in the investigation who are familiar with investigating bioburn excursions, that is very beneficial. And one of the first things we always recommend is that you identify the microorganisms. That can help you understand the source uh, or the potential source and then assist you or, or help you to be able to fix it. Another question we get is, what is a spike and can we discount outliers? Now with spikes, there is no standardized approach regarding whether it is a, uh, you know, a, what, what is a spike and what is not a spike. It is, it is common in the industry to use a term, to use a, anything that is more than twice the overall average of the 10 samples that that's how many tested, then that one, that one value, which is twice the average, could be considered a spike. But what you do with those spikes, uh, again, there, there is no standardized approach on what to do with them, and certainly it is usually not appropriate to, to consider it an outlier and to discard that data. It is likely an indication of some type of problem that you're having should be addressed rather than just discarded and, and have you proceed. A critical portion of a bioburden test is a recovery efficiency. The recovery efficiency helps you to understand when you perform that shaking method, to help you understand what percentage of the microorganisms are coming off of the product and going into solution. Now, in all the different shaking methods, it is, it is important to determine that recovery efficiency, or else your plate count, your, your vibrant count of 10 CFU may actually be 100 CFU if your recovery method is not, is not functioning at a high percentage. When we do a recovery efficiency, there are two different approaches we can take. The first is the exhaustive rinse. It's also called a repetitive recovery. And essentially, we are performing multiple extraction methods on the same product. So we'll take one container and perform, uh, after we perform the first extraction like you saw in the video, we'll then perform three more. And we just determine how many, or how many CFUs we're getting on the first extraction compared to the other extraction. In order to validate a, a recovery efficiency, we're usually testing between three and ten samples and to perform that same procedure. Now, the exhaustive rinse method is very good for natural, for higher natural bio burden. So on the left hand, you see a great example of a recovery efficiency. Uh, you see extraction one, we got off 67 CFU, extraction two, 15, and so on. 
And the calculations you see below is the first count, which is 67, divided by all the extractions added together. So in this example, the percent recovery is 75.3%. Now on the right-hand side, if you have very low natural bioburden, you can see that you start off with 0 CFU or even 1 CFU and you get all zeros. In this case, uh, we don't know how effective that extraction method is, so usually we say use a different method. That different method we call an inoculated product recovery efficiency. In this case, we're inoculating with a known number of microorganisms, usually spores. Milling mills dry on the product. We perform one extraction, and I'll show the calculation next. Again, usually we're performing this test on between three and ten samples to validate a percent recovery. And this is best when the, when the bio burden, the natural bio burden is low. So in this example, uh, the number we put on the product is 78 CFU. And if we got off 59, then we just divide 59 by 78, and that gives us our percent recovery of 75.6%. Frequently asked questions for this. Uh, first is, what is a good percent recovery? And uh, really, a good percent recovery for me is something that is consistent. Uh, I'm not always looking for an exact value, but the consistency, if I tested five different samples for recovery efficiency, as long as those five are fairly consistent, we're in good shape. Now, uh, frequently we get the question is, is it something less than 50% acceptable? Now, the standard, the bioburden standard, which is 11737-1, it does describe that a, a, a per percent recovery of 50% or greater is desirable. And not required, but is desirable. What we do if we get a value below 50%, we consider the extraction method that was used and maybe try another one, a different extraction method, or maybe we add a second extraction method to the one we use to try and improve that percent. If we find that percent recovery cannot be improved upon much, we go back to the comment that if the data is consistent, then, then it is a reliable recovery efficiency and, and can be used. The way we use a percent recovery is to take the bioburden average, which is usually the average bacterial count plus the average fungal count, add those together and divide that by the recovery efficiency as a fraction or as a decimal. So uh, the recovery efficiency is 75%. You divide the bioburden average by 0.75 to get your bioburden estimate. The next uh, important thing to understand is verification dosing. Now, verification doses are what we use to validate a sterilization dose. It is important to distinguish between the term verification dose and sterilization dose. So uh, depending on which one you're using, a which, which validation method you are using, a verification dose of 10 samples, represent the 10 to the minus 1 SAL, or sterility assurance level, or 100 samples represent 10 to the minus 2. And we'll go through the various validation methods uh, here soon. And in concept, the verification dose is similar to a half cycle or a fractional cycle in ethane oxide. And then the sterilization doses that we use usually represent a 10 to the minus 6 SAL, which represents a, a 1 in 1 million probability of a non-sterile product. And that is usually what we're applying to products that are sold. Frequent asked question for verification dosing. Why can't I just irradiate 10 samples at my sterilization dose and see if they're sterile? We get this quite often. And the, the, the way that we explain that is first, what sterility assurance level does the sterilization dose represent? In the previous slide, we talked about it representing a 10 to the minus 6 SAL, which means a 1 in a million probability of a non-sterile product. So based on that knowledge, how many samples would we have to test in order to verify that SAL? And the answer to that is 1 million samples. So if I test 10 samples, you can demonstrate an SAL of 10 to the minus 1. So when you test 10 samples and you try to extrapolate a 10 to the minus 1 value to a 10 to the minus 6 value, which represents 1 in a million, that is impossible to do. So a test of 10 samples does nothing to demonstrate a, any level of sterility which you want to have on a sterile medical device. <coughs> Here's an example of, the, of one of our dosing tables. This comes from VDMAX, which is one, one of the validation methods. And you see on the left you have the bioburden count. 
So for example, if my Vibrant count is 105 CFU, I would go up to the next value of 110. And then the red arrow you see gives us the verification dose of 9.0. So that is the dose that we would apply to the number of samples and then test those for sterility afterwards. And you see the sterilization dose up on top. In this table, this is the MAC 25. So you're validating a sterilization dose of 25 kilograms. Now, in method one, the table is fairly similar. In the left column, you have the bioburden count. Again, you'd round up to the next highest value, so 110 CFU. And your verification dose would be 8.1. You look up at the top, you see the verification dose, SAL, is 10 to the minus 2. And then if that, if that test passes, then your sterilization dose, at a 10 minus 6 would be 21.3 kilograms. And again, we'll go through this, uh, this approach in more detail soon. So verification dose range. On the table, it gives you what your target verification dose is. Now, a typical range is your target dose plus or minus 10%. For example, if you have a target dose of 9 kilograms, you're looking at plus or minus 0.9 kilograms. So your dose range then would be 8.1 to 9.9 .9 kilograms. Now you, you check the dose delivered after the samples come back with your dosing certificate. If the samples receive anything above 10% of that target dose, then you have to retest. So in this example, you're allowed up to 9.9 .9 kilograms. If it hits 10 kilograms or above that, then you have to retest. And that's the dose New, new samples and then perform the truly test on those. If the average, uh, you, to check the lower end, you check, if you, you check the average of the minimum and maximum doses delivered. And if that's less than 10% of the target dose, you can continue the test and see if you pass, or you, or you are allowed to redose and then retest. The example of there is, for example, if the minimum dose delivered was 7.2 kilograms and the max is 8.4, the average is 7.8. And you see that 7.8 falls below the 8.1 kilogram bottom end up in the up in the towards the top of the slide. So if I got eight if the average of those 7.8, it is it is outside of the 10%. I could test if I wanted to. And if I pass the stability test, obviously I can proceed because it receives less than it could have. But if I fail, then meaning I get too many positives on that test, then I can retest. Sterility testing, the proper term is test of sterility. So to perform a test on product which has received a fractional or sublethal cycle, the proper term is, a, is to perform a test of sterility. And the standard, as you see there, is 11737-2. Now the definition is there, but really we're just looking to see if any viable microorganisms remain after the products receive a, a fractional or sublethal cycle. Now, after the verification dose, the samples undergo a test of sterility, and it's usually in SCDB, which is soybean casing digest broth, which is also called TSB, trips case soy broth, at 28 to 32 degrees Celsius for 14 days. Now, this grows most microorganism types and is by far the most common uh, incubation condition which is used. After that, those 14 days, the, the samples are scored as positive or negative for growth. Now, in this case, rather than filtering the, an extraction of the samples, usually we're just placing the samples right in the growth medium and letting that sit for 14 days. On the left, you see no growth. It's a nice, clear amber color. On the right hand, you do see growth, which is a, you see a, what we usually call turbidity, some type of growth that may have color. And I'll show some other examples of different growth, or growth characteristics soon. Can other growth conditions be used? Sometimes uh, we'll use FTM, fluid dog glycolate medium, for anaerobic and, and aerobic growth. So if you, if you uh, know, for example, if it's a tissue-based product, or if you know that you have strict anaerobes on your product, then testing and five glycolate medium in addition to the soybean casein or instead of the, the standard soybean casein digest broth uh, is appropriate. Also, sometimes we're using soybean casein digest broth medium or, or FTM with additives to neutralize anything that might be inhibiting microorganism growth. Now, longer incubation times, we get that question occasionally, 
really longer incubation times, for example, 21 or 28 days instead of 14 days. There, at this point, there's nothing in the literature to suggest that longer incubation times are required. And so generally, the 14-day incubation time is used. What are the false positives? So a false positive would be a sample which is positive for growth after a facility test, but the growth is due to something other than a microorganism which survived sterilization treatment. Um, and how easy is it to distinguish a false positive? It really is very difficult to know for sure. Often we perform an investigation, and if it looks like the microorganism may have been a false positive, rather than discounting that positive and proceeding, an additional test needs to be performed after implementing some form of corrective action. What are the false negatives? A false negative is a sample which should have been positive for growth because there were surviving microorganisms on, on the product, but they were not able to grow due to something in the test system which, which inhibited their growth. If your product exhibits or if your product inhibits microorganism growth, sometimes people will say, well, that's a good sign. My, you know, my product inhibits growth. The, the problem is that if there is something inhibiting growth in the sterility test system, then that test system is unreliable. So we need to make sure that the test system is working properly or it's an invalid test. And how do you distinguish a false negative? The way we determine that is with a bacteriostasis, fungistasis, or a BF test. The, the bulk of this method is, the bulk of this test is described in USP 71, or called the validation test. For STDB. And the validation test includes we add Bacillus Aspergillus brazilianceus, and Canada albicans at less than 100 CFU into bottles of product. So the bottles have the media and your product, and you just see if the microorganisms can grow in the presence of your product in the growth medium. And we just do a simple visual comparison to control these same microorganisms, but without your product. Now, one change, the USP-71 that we do for, for radiated product, is that ISO 11737-2, which is the truly test standard for ISO, describes that the growth conditions for the BF test should be identical to the growth conditions used in test of truly. So in a, in a radiation test where you use a truly test where you use uh, SCDB at at 28 to 32 degrees Celsius. For the BF test, you would also use the same temperature of 28 to 32 degrees Celsius. So in a BF test, growth is good. We want to see growth because that means that we've neutralized any inhibition in the test system. And I just wanted to show the different types of growth that we might see in a sterility test. You see some of them are very clear except at the bottom. For example, on the left, a small cotton ball type growth on the, on the bottom or it might be completely turbid, like you see more on the right. The, uh, we're now going to go to Wendy Wayne's yard to talk about different validation methods. Thanks, Mark Helm. Well, now I'm going to walk you through the basic validation methods that are available for radiation sterilization. And the most common one we see is the BDMAX method, which stands for verification dose maximum. And this information can be found in the ISO standard 11137-2 and specifically in Clause 9. Now there are a couple of approaches to this. Um, you may have some idea of what your bio-burden already is, so you can pre-select your sterilization dose. Um, but it is bio-burden based, and so the testing that is performed is you take 10 samples from each of three different lots, um, you perform the bioburden testing, you determine a recovery efficiency, and typically we will perform one recovery efficiency for each 10 samples tested. So we'll have three recovery efficiencies associated with that, and then we will calculate the bioburden estimate. At that point in time, you take it to those tables that we showed you earlier, and you select your sterilization dose based on your bioburden. The most common one we see is that a 25 kilogram sterilization dose. So once you go to those tables and you determine your verification dose, you apply it to 10 samples. And we recommend um, sending 20 so that in case a confirmation test is needed, you already have those samples available for testing. Um, as Martel discussed, the BF test is necessary to validate that test of sterility. 
and uh, we typically perform that in duplicate, so we request six samples. And then also the sterility test is performed on 10 samples that have received that sterilization dose. Here we have the acceptance criteria for that test. So if you have zero or one positive on the first 10, you pass and you are able to move on to your sterilization test. If you happen to see two positive tests on that first set of 10, you are able to form a confirmation test on another 10 samples. And if you see no growth on those, you are at those two out of 20 and you pass. If three or more are seen, um, you obviously fail and you need to look at maybe using a higher sterilization dose, such as 27.5 kilograms. Um, here's the information regarding the confirmatory test. And once again, um, the rationale for irradiating 10 extra samples um, makes sense here in that you already have the samples available, and you don't need to waste extra time on the dosing and the time involved in that. Now, if you pass at your initial validation, then you move on to performing quarterly dose audits, and that is performed every three months once you are in manufacturing. There is also criteria for validating one batch, and the testing is exactly the same as that being for the three-lot validation. It's just performed on one lot. And then once you have three separate lots of data, you can move on to a three-lot validation and quarterly just audit. it. And at the bottom of this slide, here is our little soapbox, um, which Martel somewhat explained regarding testing 10 samples of sterilization dose. Never, ever, ever perform a sterility test at a sterilization dose. Just use the verification dose. And now here's an example. Um, we tested three lots of product, and here are our averages, and we take the overall average. And as you can see at the bottom there, one of the criteria is that no single batch average can be more than twice the overall average. If that's the case, you use that individual lot to set the dose. In this case, as I said, we typically perform recovery efficiencies on three samples. And here is an example of recovery testing where we have the three percentages. And we take the average of 83.8%. And then you go ahead and determine your bio-burden estimate. As you can see down there in the bottom corner, we get um, 108.2 CFU. We take that to the table. It corresponds to a verification dose of 9.0 kilogram. We expose the samples, you perform the sterility test, and you're able to sterilize your product at a minimum of 25 kilogram and release your product. Now, there are other tables available for the EMAX doses. Right now, only the 15 and the 25 kilograde doses are described in the 11737, excuse me, 11137-2 document. These other doses are found in ATIR 33, although ISO is in the process of putting together a document that also contains these values. And as you can see here, um, the difference between these is the maximum CFU that are allowed for your sterilization. So if you've got a product that needs a low sterilization dose, you, know, you can get that down to very, very low numbers, um, you can go ahead and use that, say, a 15 kilogram dose. And in the middle, you see the 25 kilogram, which is the most common. But then if you have product that has a high bio burden, you do have other options available to you. Um, just went over this that, you know, yes, there are these other doses available, but internationally it is not recognized yet. We hope to have that document done in 2011. Um, there are some companies that have completed this successfully, but as of now, just 15 and 25 are available. ISO. And I'll briefly describe the method one procedure, and this information can be found in 11137-2 in clause 7. And in this case, you have a, uh, a bio burden specific dose that associates with your product. Um, that was mentioned earlier in those slides where we showed you the, the method one table. Um, the testing is exactly the same as the BD max where you test 10 samples from three different lots for bio burden, you determine recovery efficiency, you calculate your bio burden estimate. In this case, though, you send 100 samples to receive the verification dose. 
And uh, once again, extras are always nice in case something happens with your packaging or um, issues therein. Um, BF testing is performed and 100 samples used for the test of sterility. Your acceptance criteria for method one is that you are allowed two positives out of those 100. And if you see three or more, you need to look at another method. Once again, our little soapbox never perform a sterility test after a sterilization dose. Um, same concept. Um, once you pass, you perform quarterly dose audits. And also, there is a single lot option available for method one. Um, when should you choose method one versus BDMAX? Well, originally, people were looking for very low sterilization doses, so the method one met their needs. Um, now, with the other doses that go as low as 15, many people are choosing the BDMAX method. The one option that is available with the method one that you don't see with the BDMAX is that you can choose other sterility assurance levels, such as, you know, 10 to the minus 3, minus 4, even minus 5. Um, obviously, a 10 to the minus 6 is the most recognized sterility associate. Um, the um, we often get asked how long this testing takes. So here is an overview of that. Um, the BioBurn incubation is typically 5 to 12 days. If you're shipping your product, you need to allow time for that. Dosing, um, you know, generally the irradiators will promise a 7 to 10 uh, working day turnaround time. The sterility test is a 14-day incubation, and the BF test is typically 5. Um, if product is unavailable, you can perform the BF test following the test of sterility, but you need to understand that will add more time to your test. And as you can see down there, you can kind of get some time here and there if you request that testing for any of them. Um, now I'll briefly talk about a method two. Um, a method two is typically used product that needs a very, very low sterilization dose. And in this case, it's based on the radiation resistance of your organisms on the product and not on the bio burden numbers. And this is a, an ideal method for products that might be sensitive to radiation. And also this information is found in 1137-2. Now, there are two different methods. There's a method 2A, and in this case, um, it requires a lot of samples. So you use 60 samples per dose in a series of nine doses that range from 2 to 18 kilograms. So for your initial testing, it's 540 samples. You perform a sterility test on all of these samples, and then you evaluate these results, and there are some calculations that are available in the standard. Once you determine a verification dose, you dose your another 100 samples at that sublethal dose. You perform the sterility test, and there's another series of calculations that are performed to determine what your sterilization dose is. And in this case, you can get a sterilization dose as low as 11 kilograms that corresponds to a 10 to the minus 6 FAL. Now, with the test method 2B, it's the same as a method 2A, but you only use eight doses. And these range from 1 to 8 kilograms. So it's fewer samples, but it's still 480. And in this case, you can get sterilization doses as low as 9 kilograms. Um, there are available now in NETIR 40 um, reduced sampling sizes for a method 2. And you can um, use as low as three doses to establish your sterilization dose. And so if, if you know you've got very, very low bio burden on your product and um, we believe that you can get zero positives in 1, 2, and 3, or the 2, 4, and 6 option. Um, you can move forward with uh, reduced sampling sizes. Now for dose audits, um, information found in 1137-2 again. They are performed quarterly as well. In this case, bio burden testing is required, whereas it's not required in the validation. And um, as with all the methods, if your product is not manufactured, an audit isn't necessary during that quarter. Um, here is the flow of a dose audit. We do a bio burden test of 10 samples. You use the verification dose that is determined on the uh, validation. You use the same number for the sterility test, and then the acceptance criteria that was discussed before um, 
zero or one or two positive passes, and if you've got three, then you need to look at some different options. Now I'm going to turn the time back over to Martel, and he is going to finish up with just some general comments about radiation testing in general, and then once he has finished, we'll take some of your questions. Thank you. We get this question quite a bit regarding, uh, you know, which organisms are, are resistant to radiation? What are the ones I have to worry about? And uh, because in reality, uh, spores are not the most resistant microorganisms to radiation sterilization. That is why we do not use BIs in radiation studies. That the spores are not most resistant. So here are some ideas of the more resistant bugs that we see. You see Cryptococcus, which is a yeast. Uh, alternary is a mold we see that sometimes can be resistant. We have kind of what we call a pink bug conspiracy here. Uh, it just ends up that there are several bacteria which are which grow which look pink on the auger plate when they grow, and they all are quite resistant to radiation. Uh, we have Mesolobacter, which is a gram negative rod in pink. We have Dinococcus, a gram positive cocci in pink, and Rosimonas, which is also another gram negative rod. In pink. Now, Rosiumonas is different from the other two uh, in that uh, Rosiumonas uh, has been shown to be a clinical, a potential clinical problem uh, with, with humans. Now, why are these more resistant than spores? Uh, with radiation, the, the, all the, a lot of the available literature suggests that the main mode of action against microorganisms with radiation is affecting the DNA. And, uh, Spores, uh, even though they're in a spore form, they're very resistant to heat and temperature and things like that. They still have genetic material or DNA inside. So these bugs appear to either have very efficient DNA repair mechanisms, or uh, in one case we know of where the microorganism carries four copies of its DNA at all times. So if one of them gets damaged, it can go to the other one and continue to reproduce. What about viruses? Uh, we actually don't test for viruses at all in the medical device industry. Uh, not, uh, not from a sterilization standpoint. The way the approach is taken in radiation and other forms of sterilization is that uh, if there's a potential for viruses in a, for example, a tissue component of a medical device, then uh, the donor is screened for viruses before the tissue is, is processed and, uh, and added to the product as a component. We'll talk a minute about maximum dose testing. Uh, everyone knows that you have to demonstrate your product can handle radiation doses. The problem is what we see very often is we see that the companies will irradiate product in their normal processing window. In this example here, for example, 25 kilogray to 40 kilogray, and they'll they'll just pull samples from that standard processing dose and then test those for functionality and aging and things like that. The problem is that every time you send product in for that 25 to 40 kilogram range, you'll get a different dose. So in one instance, you might get up to 30 kilogram, the next one you might get up to 35. So the best approach here is to provide a little bit of a buffer above your 40 kilogram maximum dose range. So if your maximum, if your typical dose range is 25 to 40 kilogram, then for all your functionality and accelerated aging and things like that, you really should dose product at 45 kilogray and then perform your functionality and, and aging. Now, this allows for two situations which can occur. The first is uh, every once in a while, the irradiator might accidentally overdose your product. For example, instead of hitting 25 to 40, it might hit 41 kilogray. And obviously, uh, you're not going to see any huge differences between 40 and 41 kilogray with regard to product damage. But uh, if you don't have the data, then it can be difficult to release the product. The other option is sometimes uh, you might be doing your dose audits and you might fail a dose audit, meaning you get too many positives in your truly test, which might mean that you either temporarily or permanently need to increase your sterilization dose. And if you've done all of your, your uh, testing at a higher dose, then it gives you a, a buffer to be able to do that. Talk briefly about family grouping. Uh, that we uh, have some examples here with pictures. You see that's the, uh, the Marshall Winter family group down there. Uh, but I just want to use these pictures to explain the concept. The concept is, that it should be, that uh, based on the products that are in the product family, if something happens to one of the products in the family, 
that same bio burden problem should occur on the other bio burden, on the other products in the family. So it doesn't it doesn't matter only how they look or uh, or what their components are, but it's also important to understand what the bio burden is. So we see the example there. That's a picture of Wendy, and uh, bio burden is likely fairly similar. Whereas the monkeys, even though they look the same with arms and fingers and toes, the bio burden on those is likely very different. So you can't go only off of how they look, but uh, bio burden is critical. And the cat, not only is the bio burden different, but also the configuration is very different. So that making sure that that bio burden connection is present between all the products in the family is critical. And I'm not going to go into it any more than that at this point, but any questions you might have, we can address either here or separately. I'm going to cover just briefly types of radiation and then we'll take questions. The most common types we see in order here are gamma is the most common, electron beam is, uh, is uh, becoming more common, and then x-ray is something that, uh, that is possible but uh, very seldom used. So gamma radiation, uh, what we have there is the, you see that there's a cutaway pencil there is what it's called and you have uh, multiple pencils in the in the rack that you see in the background there and the pencils contain radioactive cobalt which is cobalt 59 which is taken on an additional neutron and then electron in a uh, nuclear reactor and becomes cobalt 60 and then it emits gamma radiation. Now I have a video here which hopefully also will work. Uh, this is courtesy of Nordion Systems and they're the people who uh, they're one of the larger manufacturers of both the cobalt pencils as well as the radiation systems. So in this, let's see here. So the, the main idea behind most gamma radiators is called a shuffle and dwell. So you see these canisters here contain your product inside and the canisters are loaded on one side here. The, they're brought into the radiation chamber. There are four rows of product here. In the middle of the four rows, there is where you have the, the radiation source. Now, when it's not in use, it is dropped in a pool of water, which is below. When it is in use, it is, uh, it is just raised out of the water, and then it's emitting the gamma radiation. Now, your product in these canisters just shuffles to each position and dwells there for a certain period of time, then shuffles to the next position. So by the time it comes out the other side, your, your product in these canisters has, has seen every position uh, in, this, uh, in this system. Now, uh, with gamma, the advantage of the gamma is it has excellent penetration. It can go through a lot of material before the dose starts to get lower or, or attenuate. Very long history of use and can provide a pretty tight dose range. By that we mean if your minimum sterilization dose is 25 kilogram, then usually if you multiply that by 1.6, that will give you what kind of processing window the irradiator will want to use. So in a 25 kilogram example, the max dose will be 40. So the typical processing range would be 25 to 40 kilograms. Disadvantage is the cobalt is radioactive, and as a result, it is often misunderstood. Uh, people think that product coming out the other end are radioactive and they're going to kill people, and that's certainly not the case. It also has a very low dose rate. A 25 kilogram dose is applied in three to six hours. Now, compared to an EO cycle, that's, that's still pretty quick, but you'll see upcoming with, with electron beam that it can be much faster. So electron beam, uh, this video is provided by Beam One. They're one of the electron beam uh, companies here in the US. And a very similar situation here. You see the, uh, this is a, an electron accelerator here. It's an electron beam coming out in the scan horn. It just scans up and down. In reality, it scans much faster than that. But you see the speed that these, uh, these totes are going by the, the beam. That is about how fast they, they really go. And products, you'll see over here, these, these totes, after they go through once, they then spin. They're flipped over, and then the other side is irradiated. And then usually it's just a two-sided radiation, and then they come out the other end. So uh, in this case, you have a very high dose rate. So you're applying 25 kilograms in a matter of seconds or minutes, depending on how much radiation you need, rather than hours. It provides a short processing time. The power level is adjustable. 
and you do have on-off capabilities, so you can just pull the plug and be done. It is no longer radioactive. Disadvantages are that it does it does not penetrate as well through product as gamma does. So you might not be able to fit as much product in there, or the more dense product may be more challenging. Because it is a very technical, uh, high-tech piece of equipment, there is often some higher maintenance involved. And uh, also, because of the less penetration, you often have a broader dose range. So you're looking at about a 2.0 multiplier, so 25 to 50, or maybe even 25 to 55 or 60, depending on your product density, is more common. Okay, that is uh, that is the, the end of our presentation there. So we have some time here for questions. Let's go through. We got some very good questions here. So we'll go through what we can and the amount of time that we have. Uh, one question asked was, do I have to conduct organism identifications in the quarterly dose audit testing when the method VDMAX is used? And the comment is that the efficacy of the radiation sterilization is based solely on the number of vibrant anyway. Now, um, it is true that in a dose audit, you perform a vibrant test and a sterility test at the verification dose. And that really is all you absolutely have to have to demonstrate that the product is sterile. However, a knowledge of the types of microorganisms present on your device is, is very beneficial and really is critical in some instances. So what is recommended is that uh, initially, when a product is being uh, manufactured and initially being sterilized, it is very wise to perform some characterization. It does not have to be full identification. For example, instead of getting an actual name to genus and species, you can just find out what the gram stain reaction is. So it gives you an idea what general types of microorganisms they are, and that helps you understand where, where the source may be coming from. Uh, we have a series of questions uh, here uh, from another person. If a primary package material manufacturer changes sterilization site, do you have to repeat, do you have to com repeat the complete validation or not? Now, generally, if you, uh, if you change sterilization location, for example, if I'm right now irradiating with gamma at one location uh, and then switch to a different state or, or a different company, uh, this is actually covered in 11137-1, I believe it's in clause 11, uh, where it talks about this. But from gamma to gamma, different facilities, there really is no validation required with regards to microbiology. All that is required is that a new dose map is performed at the new location. Now, if you're switching from gamma to electron beam or electron beam to gamma, since there are different radiation types, then what is most common is just to, is just, uh, to perform a dose audit using the new sterilization type. And that generally works very well. Now, if the manufacturer changes manufacturing site, what is required there? Uh, generally, uh, you have two options. Uh, the, the standard does not require either revalidation or a dose audit, but one of those two is, is, is uh, very common. If the feeling is that the biobird may be changing substantially, or if the site is substantially different, then revalidation is very common. If it is the same equipment and just moving to a new facility, for example, same people involved, uh, you're just moving to a larger facility, same uh, manufacturing controls and processes, then uh, we have seen people just do a dose audit rather than a full validation and have that be successful. Um, the next part of that question is, how long should we continue to perform dose audits, revalidation, on a quarterly basis? When can we perform it on a yearly basis? Now, the standard does allow for this, but in order to reduce the frequency of your quarterly dose audits, you need to have um, organism numbers and types. So, if you are looking at reducing the frequency of your dose audits, um, at the very least you should be gram staining your organisms so that you do have an idea of numbers and types. And then you can look at reducing the frequency to twice a year and then once a year after that. But at a minimum, you should have a year's worth of quarterly dose audits in order to move forward with that. Next question is, if we validate the sterilization process and then alter the design of the product, is there a guideline to determine if revalidation is required? Uh, there is no uh, real guidance on this. Generally, the process uh, is, 
you go through a change control process. If the alteration of the product is minor, and if the change control determines that it would likely have minor impact on the resulting bioburden, then it is appropriate to only do a dose audit rather than a full revalidation. But if the, if the change is significant, then a full revalidation may be required. But it is very common to perform, uh, it's very common to, to make small changes to a medical device and just do a dose audit to address if that change requires an increase in the sterilization dose. Got a question on, uh, I think it was when we were talking about, you know, that you have to test a million product to demonstrate 10 minus 6 SAL. Got a question about how do you do that. And really, our point in bringing that up is to make it clear that you do not. You should never perform sterility testing on product that has received a full sterilization dose. For that reason, it is unreasonable to expect that you would test a million products to demonstrate a 10 to minus 6 SAL. So the, product, the concept there is only do testing at an SAL which is reliable or which is, which is possible, like 10 to minus 1, 10 to minus 2, which is 10 samples or 100 samples. Let's see. Um, okay, yeah, some of these questions look like we did cover. Uh, question, are endotoxin and cytotoxicity tests required at some point for any purpose related to sterilization process? Um, endotox there are two very different things. So endotoxin, that determines the, if there is any endotoxin present. Endotoxins occur on the surface of gram-negative microorganisms. And that they can be, they are often a pyrogen, which means that it can cause fever. Now, in many medical devices, uh, if the product has contact, either direct or indirect contact with circulating blood, then that might cause a fever in the patient or the recipient of the, uh, of the implant. So, uh, in those, it, it actually is not, whether endotoxin testing is required is not based on whether it's radiation or EO, but it is required based on the product type. When endotoxin testing is required, because the product type, it is common to do that test after all stages of manufacturing, which includes sterilization. And that is usually a batch by batch test. It is a batch release criteria. And cytotoxicity uh, would also be required not, uh, not as part of sterilization validation, but as part of your, your biocompatibility screen. Uh, cytotoxicity is, is always one of the tests required. And that should also be done after a full or a max radiation dose. For example, 45 kilograms is your typical dose range is 25 to 40. Okay, we're scanning through some of these other questions here. So we have uh, about two minutes here. Let's see. Uh, Uh, here's a quick one. Is a VDMAX dose audit, is it considered a failure if you get one positive? It is not. You're allowed one positive out of the 10 sample and test for VDMAX. Uh, let's see here. What type of radiation is recommended for liquid containing products? You know, uh, E-beam or gamma can be used on a product that, that contains liquid. Uh, but it is more common to use gamma because it does have better penetration capability. For electron beam, water is a very difficult uh, product, a very difficult uh, medium to, to go through. So unless, it, unless they're very small vials, then uh, gamma is, is more commonly used than electron beam. All right, uh, we'll just cover one more question here. Unfortunately, like I said, we can't cover all of them, but there's a good question here. If we manufacture the same product at two different facilities, same processes, do we need to perform dose audits for the product at both facilities? That's a family grouping question. The, and the radiation standard does allow for grouping of, of products from multiple facilities into one family. And the benefit of family grouping is that then only one product is used to represent that family in dose audit. So, uh, so it is possible to do that, and there is guidance on how to do that in the standard. We'd be happy to provide additional guidance as well, and uh -huh. if that's helpful. The gamma dot, we got to do that. <laughs> okay, we got one last question. <laughs> uh, gamma dot needed or not? 
uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with them, uh, these are uh, small stickers that are put on product and they change color with radiation. So it might start off in yellow and then with radiation dose. Uh, they change to red. They are a very simple indication that radiation was applied to the product. Now, they are not an indication that 25 kilograms, for example, if that's your sterilization dose, it is not an indication that 25 kilograms was applied. So in the industry, uh, in the sterilization industry, we fear that sometimes the radiation stickers are a, are a, uh, a dangerous crutch because what you can end up with is a situation where uh, the, the indicator has turned color, maybe it received some radiation, or maybe it got left out in the sun uh, for a long period of time. It can change the color and make you think that the product is sterile. When in actuality, uh, the, the preferred method is just having good process controls in place to know whether the product is sterile or not. So they're not at all required and they're actually discouraged by the, by the sterilization industry in general. Turn the phone over to Mike Kazai. Thanks, Mark Dillon and Andy. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time today to be able to um, teach on this topic. Just a couple of quick things. Uh, we have a special webinar planned for November 17th. Um, that will be uh, kind of a niche webinar for those that manufacture uh, face masks, gowns, and drapes. Um, so registration will be open soon for that event. Uh, it will be on November 17th starting at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific Coast time. Uh, again, uh, we appreciate you attending this webinar today, uh, and we hope that you all have a great day. Thank you.